Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this morning's session on open access books, a topic which inspires uh, a lot of questions and a lot of thought, hint, hint. So we have two uh, presentations this morning. Mitu Lucraft from Springer Nature will present on extending OA book readership based on their extensive experience and research. And then Martin Eve and Francis Pinter will present a new funding model for open access books based on a partnership between Central European University Press and the COPIN project. So first, over to you, Mitu. Thanks, Mark. Hello, everyone. Great to be here at R2R. If I could have my slides up, please. Okay, super. So um, go to next slide, please. One of the things I'm very privileged to have a chance to look at in my day-to-day -day job is what impact are we making as a publisher on the research communities that we support, whether that be authors, the wider researcher community as readers, or about how we support institutions and funders. And thinking about the impact of open access, what we want to be able to see is are we delivering on that promise of, if we make all research openly available, does it enable a greater number of users to benefit from that work? Can they find it? Can they use it? Can they reuse it? And can they build on it? So in setting out to look for evidence of this for open access books, we wanted to look at the geographic distribution of usage for scholarly monographs when they're published open access. Can we see that open access books are read more than non-open access books? And where is that readership coming from? Can we see that we're reaching readers who would not have otherwise have had access to scholarly monographs. Next slide, please. S to put this into context, Springer Nature has over the past seven years published more than a thousand open access books that covers most disciplines across the humanities and social sciences and STM. Most book types, monographs, edited volumes, short form monographs, so briefs and pivots and major reference works. And across these titles, we've seen more than 100 million chapter downloads since 2013. So all in all, that provides an extensive resource available from which to draw on for analysis. Next slide, please. So in 2020, we partnered with the Collaborative Open Access Research and Development Group, CORD, based at Curtin University to explore the effects of open access on the geographic reach of scholarly books. The analysis is based on a data set of almost 4,000 Springer Nature books, including 281 that had been published open access. To our knowledge, this is the biggest study of its kind. And to ensure that we're sharing the evidence, we have released a joint white paper, a preprint that presents the findings, and CORD are currently finalising a research paper. And the links to those available documents are included in this slide as well. Next slide, please. Why focus on readership? Well, we knew from previous research with authors that being able to reach a broad and diverse readership is the number one thing that authors want to achieve with their book, whether OA or not. In our 2019 white paper, The Future of Open Access Books, we also heard from authors where they had published open access that reaching readers in low and lower middle income countries was of particular concern. Similarly, we knew from funders who've supported open access books that there's a desire to see that research achieve global impact and be read as widely as possible. It might seem intuitive that open access reaches more readers, but evidence for that, especially for books, has been limited. So to really strengthen our argument, we need to know how much more is open access benefiting books, not just that it achieves more downloads, but how many more, and not just reaching more countries, but how many more and which ones. Next slide, please. So what did we find? Given that we had some previous analysis from our 2017 white paper, The Open Access Effect, we had anticipated that we would see more usage and more citations from open access books. What the CORD analysis shows is not only support for that analysis, but they also saw an even more robust effect for downloads, the geographic down diversity of those downloads and for citations. Downloads of open access books in the study were on average 10 times higher than those of non-open access books, and citations of open access books were 2.4 times higher on average. Next slide, please. 
Here you can see individual charts that compare open access in orange and non-open access in blue. So if you can't see the detail, focus on the colors. What you can see are downloads, citations and web visibility across five broad subject groupings and three product types. So that's monographs, edited collections and then shorter form monographs, briefs and pivots combined. What we can see is that across every category of book in the sample, there's a usage advantage. That effect is across every disciplinary grouping in HSS and STM and across all three years of publication in the study and across all types of books. So monographs, edit edited collections, admin and mid-length books. That effect is also seen for every month after publication. So for all 40 months in the analysis, open access books recorded significantly more downloads than their non-open access counterparts. So that means open access books are not only having a higher number of downloads to begin with, that effect is persistent over time. Next slide, please. Turning then to the geographic diversity of usage, although both non-open access and open access books achieve international and global reach in this sample, again, we found open access books in the study had a much greater proportion of usage in a wider range of countries. For the non-open access books, which is the, the map on the right-hand side, usage was seen in 125 countries, and that reflects the availability of Spring and Nature's ebook packages around the world. But on the left hand side, again, we see open access books were downloaded in 61% more countries than non open access books. These maps are coloured using log scales. So the darkest purple colour represents a 10,000 fold increase in readers. So you can clearly see where the concentration of users and usage is coming from. So for both OA and non OA, the highest levels were in the US, the UK, Germany, and mainland China. Usage of open access books was also identified in a wide range of countries with zero usage for that non-OA book content. And that includes a number of countries in Africa, over 20 in fact. Next slide, please. We can provide a more quantitative measure of how open access books are increasing geographic diversity by looking at a disparity across country usage. A disparity index is a measure of inequality, so how much is usage deviating from the situation where all countries show even usage. Um, CORD used the Gini coefficient as a disparity index to measure levels of income inequality. The Gini coefficient here indicates more diverse usage, that is lower inequality of usage. So for the corpus as a whole, again, for orange as open access and blue for non-open access, you can see the median Gini coefficient of OA books is lower meaning that the geographical usage of open access books is more diverse. Next slide, please. Another way of approaching this is to look at logged versus anonymous usage for open access books. So logged as in access via an institution that has purchased or subscribed to at least one Springer Nature product. The bottom of these maps represents downloads from the open web, which is generally around double that of from institutional network points. So whilst we can't be 100% sure how much of that anonymous usage is the general public or non-academic usage, because some of it will be off-campus use or de personal device use by researchers, there is a clear indication that there is a greater amount of usage from readers who would not have otherwise had ha access to that content. Next slide, please. And this is my last interesting finding from the research. What we can see is that where open access books contain the names of countries and regions in their title, we could see enhanced usage for those regions with the effect most apparent for Latin America and Africa. Open access books that mentioned an African country or region in their title achieved five times more downloads. Whereas open access book that mentioned a Latin American country or region, uh, a Latin American country or region achieved a hundred times more downloads. So open access is enhancing usage in countries that are underrepresented in global scholarship, and it's also enhancing the global usage of scholarship about those countries. Next slide, please. These findings are compelling. There's no way around it. What we can see here is open access is making a substantial difference to the reach of books and their authors. Being able to demonstrate these effects for open access books can be really powerful in changing attitudes. That's both for authors who are considering whether to publish their book open access um, and knowing that they'll be able to reach a broader and more diverse readership. And for funders too, who are considering whether or not to expand open access policies and funding for books. So given the UKRI policy and coalition S's guidance for monographs expected in 2021, 
We hope this research provides encouragement for funders in supporting pro-gold OA policies for funding. And additionally, we hope these findings encourage more authors to choose open access for their work. And then my next slide is my final. Thank you very much. And I will pass over to Martin. Hello, uh, thank you very much, me too, for that. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, I should say, as the author of six open access books, it's great to hear that um, it looks like those are being used uh, on a worldwide basis. So let's say that we, we take these phenomenal findings about the usage of OA books and think this sounds like a great idea. Um, how do we get from where we are at the moment to a world in which open access monographs are the norm, a world in which there is an equitable way to publish uh, open access monographs that don't disadvantage authors? I'd say from my perspective as an academic, the number one concern that I hear from authors about open access monographs pertains to their funding. Um, there are initial concerns over licensing, there are initial concerns over what open access means for quality control, and those, those tired debates do still occur. But fundamentally, the challenge we have is one of funding OA monographs, and the book processing charge model in particular causes particular anxiety. So with um, Dr. Francis Pinter, I'm going to talk to you this morning about a model that we've been developing with the Central European University Press in order to fund open access monographs on a basis that doesn't resort uh, to uh, book processing charges. Can I have my slides, please? And could we, yeah, that's the first slide. So over to you, Francis. Thank you very much, Martin. Uh, so when I started talking to Martin about how to get over this funding issue, I thought that the, the model that uh, Martin and Copen were working on uh, was really innovative and really potentially extremely useful for a small and medium size at university presses and other um, small scholarly presses. And so what you have here uh, the CEU Press is a press that's nearly 30 years old. It has a backlist of 450 titles. Uh, the books are extremely high quality. Uh, we publish books uh, that are uh, authoritative about the region on issues that are of relevance to the world with authors from around the world and providing very unique perspectives. Um, and we, of course, like everybody else, we're finding that the traditional monograph publishing model no longer works for this kind of niche publishing. And so we are trying to look forward to an OA future. And our strongest asset is our backlist, which currently uh, we, we don't feel is reaching its potential uh, and, and re reaching all the readers who would like to look at our books. So now I'm going to turn over to Martin who will talk a little bit about the model itself and then I'll come back and say how this affects the CEU Press in particular. Over to Thank you, Martin. You. Thanks, Francis. Can I have the next slide, please? So the model that we've developed is called Opening the Future. And it's a model that brings together uh, membership-based models for open access and subscription models uh, for purchasing books. The idea behind it is relatively simple. What we wanted was a model where we could leverage the power of the backlist to draw libraries in for a, a unique subscription benefit to their institution. But then we wanted to divert the revenue that we receive from a subscription to the backlist to funding an open access front list. So the idea is that uh, libraries come to us and they get a subscription to a package of books from the backlist. These are divided into categories such as history, for instance. Uh, this provides relevant content to their institutions based on usage during the pandemic period. Um, the titles have been selected because they were the ones that people were turning to. So the subscription backlist provides high value in its own right. However, rather than just hoarding the gold from that subscription income, the idea is we then divert that into funding books from the front list for coming open access 
without charging authors a book processing charge at that point. Uh, this has several advantages. First and foremost, this means that libraries with and without open access budgets can participate. The challenge has been with open access membership models like the Open Library of Humanities that I run, uh, like Knowledge Unlatched that Francis founded, uh, that we get to a certain threshold of participatory engagement and we don't get beyond it. We have roughly 300, 350 or so libraries worldwide who participate in these collective membership schemes. But there are many, many more libraries who are purchasing books every year, but who have never funded an open access monograph um, or funded any, any of those membership schemes. With the opening the future model, we can bring in libraries who would maybe just subscribe to the backlist package for their own benefit and show them then the benefits of funding an open access front list using that system. We also have a model here that can scale dynamically. Uh, one of the real benefits is that we don't have to hit a threshold of all the books being made open access and getting 300 libraries at once. We can scale this gradually as we move through. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? So the subscription portion of the membership looks a bit like this. We give unlimited DRM free access uh, for the duration of membership to packages of 50 books at a time. If libraries remain members for three years, they own the backlist titles in perpetuity. So this is a, a generous way of buying books in the first place. It's not, um, there are no hidden fees involved. The packages don't change underneath you. We're not locking people out with DRM. Uh, we're providing basically uninhibited access for subscribers to the backlist content. There is also a package for libraries that don't want to subscribe to a backlist package of books and just want to support the open access front list. So they can come along just as open access members if they want. Uh, next slide, please. The libraries basically get to choose their 50 titles from four packages and the membership lasts for three years, putting all of this towards enabling an open access front list. And I'm going to hand over to Francis now, who'll be able to talk a little bit about uh, some of the costings here and the ways in which uh, this works out as a, a very good deal for library members. Thank you, Martin. So with the subscription benefits, you'll see that we have three tiers. And here we, um, we're actually looking with the um, Carnegie tiers and the GIST type tiers, uh, larger libraries pay more, smaller libraries pay less. And we've got the um, top tier at 1200 euros, a mid tier at 800 and the lower tier at um, 350 euros. And that's simply the price of the 50 books. Uh, and that is an annual subscription until the end of the three years when the, those titles, as Martin said, become uh, owned in perpetuity by the libraries. Now, when we hit our goal of 250 libraries participating, this will equate to enabling us to publish 25 new books uh, at 11 uh, cost of it, the whole package comes to an 11 euros per uh, library, uh, per, per, per book, per, per library. So um, can I have the next slide, please? I want to show some evidence as to why it is uh, that the, we believe that these books didn't reach their potential in their old sales models, whether we're talking about the, um, the, the newer backlist or the, the older backlist. And the case that we have uh, is a study by Project Muse, where we saw that in the spring uh, of 2020, we <laughs> inadvertently and sadly because of COVID, had an incredible test case. And here we um, 
found that of the 279 titles that we uh, had with Project Muse, with their normal programs, when they made these open to everybody in the world, uh, they found that from March to June, middle of March to June, there were over 350 downloads in 129 countries. Well, there's no way that a small press could reach this kind of penetration of the market. It, it was spectacular. And what we also found, which I think was very important for us to see, is that seven of the top 10 downloads were over 10 years old, which really was a testimony to the strength of our backlist. And we also felt very pleased that the, the top downloaded title in China was called Academic Freedom. Now, I'd like the next slide, please. This slide. Francis, I think you're a slide behind with apologies. I uh, I, I can't see the, my, my slides and I think we probably, uh, Martin, do you want to? Um, could, we, could we just move one slide ahead, please? I think then we're, then we're back on track. Ah, but would have people seen the slide seven, which is the slide for the muse? Okay. Sorry, for some reason, I'm not seeing the slides, which is why I'm a bit tentative here. So uh, what is for me slide eight uh, is the um, Central European University Press opening the future slide, which says that what we're trying to do is to aim at 25 monographs a year um, as open access. And just to be clear, these are new books that will be made open access, not backlist, but these new books will still have been properly peer reviewed and quality controlled, et cetera, in the normal way that we publish. And we will not be putting titles into this program that have funding from other sources. So this is it's a very important point for libraries. There is no double dipping. The, uh, these will be the unfunded uh, titles that do not have money out of research grants, which as we know in the humanities is, is a huge number of books. It's a large number of books in the social science and a smaller number in the um, STM world. So next slide, please. Here we have how this progresses over time. Uh, and this is what Martin was mentioning to begin with, that we are recruiting members uh, for a three-year commitment, and that as the numbers grow, we increase the number of books that we can make open. It's a bit like a crowdfunder target, uh, but as soon as the calculations that you see here on average, if we um, received the mid-tier uh, payment of 800 euros a year from 250 libraries, we would be able to uh, produce our 25 monographs in OA. Now, can I have the next slide, please? So as you can see here, what we're saying is that the highest membership is equal to half an APC. That's how much it costs uh, for the largest library to participate in this program and receive their 50 titles of the backlist and support the front list. Can I have the next uh, slide, please? So there are lots of ways of looking at this and I think it's important to stress that to libraries, the amount of money that they pay each year is a constant. The subscription to a package of 50 books that turn into perpetual access after three years is fixed. And then what does this look like? Well, the variable number is the number of OA books that we can produce. And that depends on the library community. Now, if we have even more than 250 members um, 
we will be able to plow that back into innovative projects supporting open access and the infrastructure of it. Can I have the next slide, please? So as you can see from here, it's just reiterating what we've been saying, that the more libraries that become members, the more books we can make away with the money that was spent on backlist packages. And here we see that again, once we reach the 250 library level, uh, averaging 800 euros per library, we come to this very, very low uh, cost of 11 euros per book. So basically it's two sides of a coin. If you subscribe to the collection to opening the future as members of this uh, uh, initiative, then you're supporting open access at the same time. And the benefit to approaching paying for open access in this way is that it allows allocation of library expenditure to come from any one of the number of budgets. It can come from the OA budget and it can come from collection development budgets. It can come from any budget because it is both buying titles for the library, but it's also supporting open access. So Martin, I would like to hand over to you and the next slide. Thanks Francis. So the sign up form is at openingthefuture.net, um, which is a very uh, brief information collection process designed to make it easy for libraries. Um, I should also say that this uh, site is open source, so other publishers can use this if they wouldn't want to adopt the model themselves. I'll have the next slide, please. We have a range of partners who are helping us deliver this. Project Muse are providing the hosting, metadata and statistics. Uh, OAPEN will be hosting the OA content. Lyricis and JISC in the USA and UK respectively are handling marketing, billing and outreach. But of course, we also welcome others. Um, next slide, please. One of the most important things for us is that publishers need to take up this model for themselves. It's great that we can run this pilot with CEUP and it's really exciting to be working with Francis on that. But this is actually a model that we could see propagate through the university press sector and that could get us from our current point of stasis and challenge of book processing charges to an, an ecosystem that has open access at its core. Um, we're laying the groundwork we're going to produce a toolkit for other presses, but we've actually come up with a relatively low risk way that presses can start to convert their model to OA uh, without uh, those book processing charges. Uh, next slide, please. I think this one's for you, Francis. Yeah, um, this is uh, how to get in touch with us and for me to just possibly add another comment, which is, we're, the COPEM team are working very hard on um, making this model as streamlined as possible so that it can scale up. Um, what both Martin and I have found is over the years is that scaling up is really, really important. And uh, we, we have to get this right going forward. But Martin, would you like to talk about COPEM please? Very briefly, this is our last slide. Uh, I'd just like to say this is all part of uh, my work on the COPIM project, which is a three million pound Research England and Arcadia Foundation funded project. Um, it's in a partnership between libraries, universities, OA book publishers, researchers and infrastructure providers attempting to plug the missing gaps in the OA uh, book space. So I need to stop talking now because we're over to questions. Thank you so much for your time, everyone. Um, it's been great speaking and I'm really looking forward to the discussion now. Great. Thank you very much indeed. Me too, Martin and Francis. That was, that was fascinating. So we have a little time for questions. Um, I'm gonna start with you, Me too, if I can. 
Um, so some people observe that there's obviously a difference between humanities, maybe social sciences and STM. So humanities and social sciences, primary research tends to be in book form and in STM it's more secondary literature. Um, does this make any difference to usage and in general your observations on discipline usage? There are differences within disciplines, absolutely. But I think what, what we can see from this research is that pattern between OA and non-OA is consistent with disciplines. Um, so I think the, the, the effect that open access can bring, regardless of discipline, is, is the same, but the levels of difference in terms of how much more usage or how many more citations will vary by subjects. Great, thank you very much, sorry about that. Um, and Martin and Francis, any comments on discipline from your side? Any differences in the way you think about your model? I suppose we've thought a little bit about subject area and thinking about departmental budgets as ways of funding open access. Um, CU Press has an incredibly strong uh, disciplinary focus on, on post post-Soviet reconstruction, for instance, and histories of Europe since World War II. Um, it's clear that sometimes there are departmental budgets that are used to purchase books that are not part of a central library budget. Um, if we can find ways in to accessing those pots, um, we've got an, a good chance of transition based on disciplinary uh, sourcing. So really thinking about targeting value for where open access sits in the institution and think about relevant books coming to the right space is how we've thought about that. Great, thank you. Um, and just sticking with, with Francis and Martin for a moment, um, a number of questions for you about the sustainability of the model. So what happens when all the books are open access, front list and back list? How do you move essentially from an open access front list to a subscription backlist over time? Well, in our case, we think we have 27 years to get there. Uh, and the world may have changed by that time and there may be other models. Uh, so it's, it's about having a strong enough backlist for a long enough time to see how this uh, takes hold and, and how the general funding for open access uh, is positioned in a decades going forward. Right, and, and kind of re related to, to that, I mean, that makes a lot of sense, sort of related to that, um, how are you selecting which titles to make open access? Is there a pipeline of priority, uh, maybe lower income countries? You know, you said specifically, not if there was availability for open access through other funding. But, but what's the, what are your criteria? Well, the criteria, at least for now, is that uh, the, the very best titles that we think have the widest readership potential are the ones that we want to make open access because we're a mission-driven press uh, as a university press. Uh, so that's how we're going to be selecting the titles going forward. I should say also that there's quite a long lead time on this deliberately so that we can ensure that the titles that are selected to go away have not been put into a conventional sales channel. So libraries don't get confused of having, we bought that book on a pre-order uh, and then find it's going to be OA after the fact. We're trying to make it so that we're looking you know, six months down the line, a title's decision on whether it's OA or sales channel is made at that point. It doesn't change under the feet uh, of libraries. Right. No, that's 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 very helpful. Um, if I could just bring me to in now, perhaps, um, is there just responding to this part of the conversation? I know you didn't cover models in quite the same way, but is there anything that you reflect on here that that you can talk about how different access models and funding models relate to usage and readership over time? That's a really interesting question, and it's not one that we've actively explored on, on the book side. Um, I think what is very clear to us is we've just dipped our toe in the water here in looking at how is open access benefiting readers. There's so much more that we need to then do to look at how do we support more authors in actually gaining access to funding. And that's the, looking at this model is one example of that. But across 
open access books as, as, a, as a set of models. It's still so complex and so diverse. There's probably as many models as there are players involved right now. So, so how do we bring that in is, is a continued collaborative, collaborative exercise, I would say. Yeah, no, ab ab absolutely. Um, and one other question for you, for you, me too, that is in your research, did you also uncover data around how much of a book gets read? And, you know, so sort of readership habits as well as kind of the absolute number of, of downloads and access. In terms of how, how many chapters within a book do you mean? Right. Yeah. So we did analysis by chapters because that's how we actually measure our, and monitor our, our usage. And one thing that I can say is that regardless of how long a book is, you can see the same patterns for, for open access and non-open access usage. But what we haven't looked at is once readers have downloaded that book, what do they do with it? Right. Thank you very much. And we only have two minutes left. Um, so very quick question, for which is, I think, testament to, to how fascinating this is. So one last question, this time back to Francis and Martin um, around COPIM and CEUP. Can you just tell us a bit more about um, the, the limited digital rights management that's free for the duration of membership? What that, what that means kind of in my terms, i.e. layperson's terms? So it means that the files that you get from the subscription are not locked down in a way that, you know, you'll have the book on your computer one day and then not be able to read it the next. Um, we're providing downloadable PDFs of the works um, or HTML versions that are readable in the browser. So basically, it's as good as having it um, in as any kind of digital file. It's not going to be taken away afterwards. And that's just really important for fostering trust, actually. Um, if you provide things with DRM on them, you're basically saying, I don't trust you to continue supporting us. This is a, a way of um, opening ourselves up a bit to that research community and giving them useful digital artifacts. Great. Well, thank you all very much. Thank you, Martin, Francis, and, and me too. That was a, an excellent session. Lots of things to think about. And what, for me anyway, I think is a really complex, evolving area. There's a lot of clarity that you brought. Um, so next we have a 30 minute break from the main program. Uh, so you could take a break, but I suggest you don't. There's still plenty to do in R2R. Um, you can go to the networking area and interact with people live on video. Um, you can visit our sponsors in the exhibit area. Um, and 10 minutes at 11.20, there'll be the first of the lightning poster sessions. That'll be Michael Upshaw on AI tools for publishing. And if you want to continue the conversation with these excellent presenters uh, or me, we'll be in the Great Hall for a while, uh, as will uh, Nico Gonkachev as well. So please now go back to the timeline, click on the networking agenda item on the link in the session information on how to go to the networking rooms. Thanks very much. <laughs>